So I feel like I have to give a disclaimer before I actually get into the sermon today. So this is my disclaimer. If you don't know me that well yet after I've been here this long, I have a little bit of ADD, and I was practicing the sermon this morning, and I realized that the sermon has a little bit of ADD in it. And so there is a point at the end, and there's about eight little side points on the way, and just go for the ride. Just enjoy it. You'll learn some things. It'll be good. Just go with it, and don't expect it to be some linear logical. It's not there. So just enjoy the ride. We'll get somewhere eventually, trust me. I, we pray. So we'll, we'll pray about that too. So for the past few weeks, I have been, um, I've been binge-watching spy shows on Amazon and Netflix. I love watching spy shows because you never know who's on which side. And so with like the main character, you're not sure, can I trust that person or not? Are they good? Are they bad? And can I trust them now, but maybe not later? It's hard sometimes in the shows to figure out who you should trust, what, what words you can really rely on, and where are the lies and the deceit. And the same can often be true, I find, in our lives. We're bombar- we are bombarded by sound all day long, from the TV and the radio and podcasts, to our friends, to social media. Everyone is clamoring for our attention, claiming that they have the words we need. They have the information we need. They have the truth that we need. And sometimes it's hard to know who should we listen to and when should we just toss those things aside. So today I want you to take a couple of deep breaths. We're going to settle in a little bit and set aside those voices we've heard all week long. Even still that internal voice, you know the voice right now that's saying, I have a lot to get done and I need my grocery list made before the sermon's over. Set that one aside. You can do that later. Just get ready to listen for the next 30 or minutes or so to see what God might have to say to us in his word. What might scripture have to say for our lives today? If you've been reading along with us in Matthew during, during Lent, you know that yesterday we jumped way ahead to Matthew 17. So we, last week we were at the beginning of Jesus' ministry and he had the temptation in the desert. Now we're near the end. Jesus is preparing to head to Jerusalem where he will meet his violent fate. Just before our text from today, Jesus is talking with his disciples and they're up in the region of Caesarea Philippi. Caesarea Philippi is gorgeous. It is um, lush and green, um, It's in the northern part of modern-day Israel. When you're there, you can see the fence that that separates Israel from Syria. You're right along the border. Philip, Herod Philip um, was the king there. He named the city after himself. Before that, it was named Panias. And it was named Panias because in the city, or near the city, was this big, huge rock that just comes up out of nowhere. There's this huge rock. There's a cave, and if if you see the dark spot in the middle, that's a cave. And it was believed that this was the home of the Greek god Pan. And he guarded the gate to hell. So that was the very gate of hell in Panias, in Caesarea Philippi. So in the story just before ours, Jesus and his disciples are talking, and Jesus asks them who they think he is, and Peter says, you're the Messiah, the Son of God. And suddenly how Jesus responds makes more sense. This is what Jesus says. He says, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. Can you imagine Jesus saying that, saying this is the rock when you're standing by the huge rock, and the gates of Hades that you're next to won't overcome what you just said. That's the context of what's going on, where they are. There's some debate in the church about what Jesus means when he says Peter and on this rock, because Peter means rock, and if you're Catholic, you believe that Jesus says that on Peter, then Jesus will build his church. If you're Protestant like we are, then you believe that Peter got named rock, and that's great, but on his testimony is where Christ built his church, that we believe Jesus was the Messiah, Son of God. You can have those debates at home later today. First sidebar. You keep track if you want. You can tell how many there are at the end. So that's the first sidebar. So that happens. The very next thing that happens is Jesus starts telling his disciples that he's going to go to Jerusalem, he's going to suffer, he's going to be betrayed, he's going to die, and Peter says, that's never going to happen. God forbid. So Peter just said, you're the Messiah, I trust you. Uh, Jesus, you're wrong. 
And Jesus is a little concerned. He says, maybe it's tempting. He wants to believe Peter. So he responds with a lot of force. He says, Peter, get behind me, Satan. So on one moment, Peter's the rock. The next moment, he's Satan. Do you ever feel that way in your walk with God? That one moment you are on fire and you are following close and the next moment you're not sure you're, you can even believe and you wonder if it's true and you wonder if you can hold on and it all seems overwhelming. You ever have that experience? That's Peter's experience, right, as we head into our text today. And then we come to our text for today. Before we get there, I want to put a little context of where it probably happened. So some of you may have gone to Israel. And when you go to Israel, depending on the tour you get, you, when you talk about the Transfiguration, which is our text from today, they'll take you to one of two mountains. Some people go to Mount Tabor. This is the biggest mountain around Galilee. It's the mountain according to tradition that Jesus was on when he ascended into heaven. It's also according to church tradition where Jesus was when he was transfigured. And so if you're which is convenient if you're leading a tour because everything is by Mount Tabor, so you don't have to drive far to get there. So you, you just go right up, and there you are, and you have two events, and you come back down, and you go to all the other places where Jesus was because he spent most of his time right there by Mount Tabor. The problem is, in the text, in Luke and in Matthew, Jesus is by Caesarea Philippi. He goes up a mountain, he comes down, and then he goes to Galilee, so he probably wasn't at Mount Tabor where given, given Matthew is probably at by Mount Hermon. So what I didn't tell you, at Caesarea Philippi, the Mount Hermon is like the only mountain in Israel that's always snow covered because it's so high. So it's got snow in it. At the base of Mount Hermon is the city of Caesarea Philippi. That big rock is a spur coming from Mount Hermon that has the gates of Helen. So that's probably where they are, right? By the gates of hell, they start climbing up. You can climb up the rock yet today and then start climbing up Mount Hermon. It goes to about 12,000 feet. They probably didn't get that high. So that's where they are. And now let's finally turn to the word of God in Matthew 17. After six days, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John, the brother of James, and led them up a high mountain by themselves. There he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun and his clothes became as white as the light. Just then there appeared before them Moses and Elijah talking with Jesus. Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, I will put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. While he was still speaking, a bright cloud covered them, and a voice from the cloud said, This is my son, whom I love with him. I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell face down to the ground, terrified. But Jesus came and touched them. Get up, he said. Don't be afraid. When they looked up, they saw no one except Jesus. As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus instructed them, Don't tell anyone what you have seen until the Son of Man has been raised from the dead. This is the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Praise to you, O Christ. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, as we reflect on your word together today, we do long to hear from you. For we know that yours is the voice that has the words of life. Yours is the voice that speaks the truth. We ask today that you would speak, for we, your children, are ready to listen. Amen. So Peter's been publicly rebuked by Jesus, and now he's probably a little discouraged, a little downcast. You have those experiences where the person that you admire and respect kind of puts you back in your place, and then you feel a little down. That's where Peter is, but maybe more so. He just got called Satan by the Son of God. Not a good day. Six days later, he's kind of putting himself back together, and Jesus takes him and James and John. These are Jesus' three closest disciples, the, the leaders of the disciples, up a mountain. And he gives them an experience that none of them would have expected. As they climb the mountain, suddenly Jesus is changed before their eyes, and he glows. His face shines, his clothes turn white. In Luke's account, for a little context, Moses and Elijah are also glowing and have white clothes. They look just like Jesus does. So we're probably reading too much into this text to say that this is when Jesus reveals his divinity in some way. 
Because in Luke, that would make Moses and Elijah divine, and we don't think they're divine. So it's not his divinity. Instead, probably a better way to think about it is to remember back in the Old Testament, when Moses meets with God, he goes into the tent of meeting, and he meets with God, and he listens to God, and then he gives the word of God back to the people. But when he comes out of the tent of meeting, everyone's scared of Moses because he is glowing from having been in the very presence of God. So Moses wears a veil over his face to cover the glory of God that's reflected off of his face. That's probably a better way to think about it. In fact, that's, that's what Daniel says will happen to us. In Daniel 12, 3, the first place where we hear of the resurrection, Daniel says, those who are wise will shine like the brightness of the heavens and those who lead many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. The promise in Daniel is those who are raised will kind of shine with the glory of God in some way. Jesus picks up on this in Matthew 13, 43 when he says this. He says, then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. Whoever has ears, let them hear. So we'll shine like that. We actually, in our communion liturgy, we say communion is a feast of remembrance, of communion, and of hope. And when we talk about hope, we talk about how we will see Jesus made like unto him in his glory. Not that we will be divine, but we will reflect his glory back to him. That we will have that same kind of glow and experience too. If you think about it, we know people like this, not that they physically radiate the presence of God, but we know people who, when you're with them, you get a sense of the glory and presence of God different than you do other times. People talked about that with Thomas Merton, the great Trappist monk of the, of the last century who was a spiritual leader, or Dorothy Day, or um, Dallas Willard who taught at USC and led so many Protestants into this deeper understanding of how you experience the presence of God. I have friends who have met with Eugene Peterson and that's what they say. It feels different when you're with Eugene who, who wrote the message that somehow like you're with God in a different way that he helps you connect with God differently. We have that experience that some people are just, they walk close with God. And when, because they walk close with God, when you're with them, you experience, you emotionally experience the presence of God differently. That was probably Jesus all the time, but on this occasion, it's not just emotional experience. They visibly see the glory of God reflected in Jesus. And then Moses and Elijah show up. So the, the great lawgiver and the greatest prophet. Remember in Matthew, the beginning, Jesus says he has come not to abolish the law, but to fulfill the law. And now the lawgiver and the prophet, those who gave the law, those who kind of comment and call the people back to the law, come to endorse Jesus. And this is the coolest little thing that I think is neat. So Moses never finishes his job. Did you notice that? And at the end of the Pentateuch, at the end of the first five books, Moses dies, and the people of Israel are not in the promised land yet. So who fulfills the work of Moses? Joshua. Joshua fulfills the work of Moses. He leads them into the promised land in the book of Joshua, conveniently named after him. You can find it at home. Elijah. When he is carried up into heaven in the chariot of fire, remember he goes up, he doesn't die, chariot of fire, Elisha is given a double portion of Elijah's power to continue his ministry if he sees Elijah go up into heaven. Elisha sees it, he gets the power, he continues the ministry of Elijah. Did you know that Elisha is another variation of the Hebrew name Joshua? So Elijah's ministry gets, gets completed by Joshua as well. Elisha, another name for Joshua. They both mean God saves. And now, Moses and Elijah are meeting with Jesus, which is the Greek version of the Hebrew name Joshua. And so now they're all meeting with Joshua, and he will actually fulfill and complete all of their work. I just think that's really cool. That was my other sidebar. It's totally unrelated. It is, but isn't it neat? It all kind of fits. I just thought it was really cool. So the point of Matthew, and all of Matthew, he is trying to prove that Jesus is the fulfillment of of, is the second great Moses. He's fulfilling the law and prophets, and one of the ways that happens is he's Jesus, and that fulfills them, because that's who follows the law and the prophets, is Jesus. So I just think that was neat. So th but then a, uh, then a cloud comes, and the cloud shines. Have you ever been in a cloud that shines? Not, clouds don't normally shine, do they? They don't shine in that sense. Fog is kind of dark, but this cloud shines with a light from within, and you cannot help but remember that there was a cloud that shone from a light within that led the people of Israel through the desert, right? This isn't a cloud, it's God has come. So he led them through the desert. When they build the tabernacle and dedicate it, the cloud comes down on the tabernacle. When they build the temple and dedicate it, the cloud comes down on the temple. And now Jesus is, is, is reflecting the glory of God and the cloud comes down on Jesus. 
Jesus is not only the fulfillment of the law and the prophets, he's the new temple. If you want to meet God, you go to Jesus. Because God dwells in Jesus, and there he is in Jesus. The cloud comes down. That's just cool. And then, then God says something. He says, this is my son whom I love. With him, I am well pleased. Listen to him. Of all the things God could say when Peter, James, and John are seen, the glory of God are reflected in Jesus, Moses and Elijah there, the thing God says is, listen to Jesus. That's it. Listen to him. So I've been thinking today, about who, this past week, about who I listened to. And I do have ADD, so I was keeping track of who I, what I listened to on, on Tuesday. And so I listened to NPR on, on, in my car for a while, and then I ch checked in with Mike and Mike because NPR got boring, and then Mike and Mike got boring, so I switched to country. And then I went home, and I went back to NPR, and then I went to WCSG because NPR got boring. And then I came back between 12.30 and 1, and my favorite preacher is on Moody at 12.30, David Platt. I listened to him when I was driving back to work around 1 o'clock. I love David Platt. You should listen to him. These are my sidebar things. I apologize. And then I checked out CNN, and I read a little bit of a couple different newspapers. I don't want to give away too many political leanings because people are all paranoid. There were a variety of newspapers from a variety of perspectives at night. And I talked to my wife, my kids. I talked to our great staff. I even talked to my parents that day because I had lunch with my mom. It was great. And then even more than those voices, do you have that voice in your head that's always going? So I have a voice in my head. You ever have like planned conversations out? I had those conversations in my head. Like I want to talk to someone and what am I going to say? What are they going to say back? How do I respond? And you do that like I'm, I'm obsessive. That's not healthy. And then there's not only that, then there's my own debate about things, what I think and what I don't agree with myself. And you kind of decide how should you do this and how did that work? And then there's the other voice in your head. You know, the voice that points out all the things you do wrong. Do you have that voice? Yeah, yeah, the voice that tells you you're not very good and you're screw up and, well, that you have ADD and you can't stay focused on anything for any length of time. You have that voice right now going on in your head. And I have that voice too. And I listened to all of those voices and it got me thinking, in my day, when did I take time to intentionally listen to Jesus amidst all of those other voices? When do you listen to Jesus? As a simple observation, listening to Jesus doesn't happen in a quick five minutes in your day. I've been married to Rachel for 15 years now, and we have four kids. And a lot of our conversations are five-minute ones about what are we having for supper? Did laundry get done? Who's picking the kids up? Who's taking the kids home? What happened to this kid? Did homework get done? And it's coordinating schedules. But that's not how we have a relationship with each other. That's just survival, right? If I want to connect with my wife, we go for a walk around our block, and we make the kids stay home. And we even hold hands sometimes. It's really sweet. And then we talk about what we're thinking about. And sometimes we go out for lunch on Fridays, and we go to Olive Garden for lunch, and we get the cheapest thing on the menu, and Eliana comes with us. She gets breadsticks, and she just eats, and she colors, and then we get to talk. And we just connect, and we share what's going on in our lives together. When do you do that with Jesus? When do you do that with Jesus and just have time to connect? Not two minutes, but an extended period of time to actually connect and listen. So how do we begin to do that? First thing is, we ought to pray. And there's great value. There's a wonderful old, old Catholic tradition and a Jewish tradition called praying the hours, where you pray at like 6 in the morning and 9 and noon and 3 and 6 and 9, and then when you go to bed, if it's after 9, just for a few minutes to remind yourself that God is present. That is great. It's a wonderful discipline. But is there a time when you genuinely just spend time talking with God about what's on your heart for more than two or three minutes? Not the rote prayer of, God, thank you so much for our food, amen, let's eat, but genuinely praying what's on your heart. And do you take time when you pray to let God talk? Or is it a monologue? Do you take time to listen to see if God might have something to say back? Take time to pray. Second, you should read the Bible. You should read Scripture. Don't just read someone else's thoughts on Scripture. Because this is what a lot of us do. We have devotions, and you read, your, you read like the one verse at the top of the page, right? It's a really good verse. And then you get four paragraphs of someone's thoughts on that. And you know, they're great thoughts. You're kind of doing that if you're doing devotions during Lent. You get like eight verses, then into your right, gives you a page and a half or so. And there's some value in that. But as an observation, if I want to know what my wife thinks, I don't go to my kids to ask them what they think their mom thinks. I go ask my wife what she thinks. And then I know what she thinks because she tells me. 
Don't go to an intermediary. Go with the, to the Word of God. Actually read real live Scripture in front of you and read it and reflect on it yourself. You can do devotions too, but actually read Scripture. And if you do that, you'll find that sometimes you read it and you're confused. If you're not confused, you should read more. You'll get there. We all get confused. And talk about it with other people who might be equally confused. And together in your confusion, you'll get some clarity and talk about it with other people and try to understand it. But then you have to apply it. Because listening isn't just hearing what someone says, it's responding to what they say. So I was thinking about this recently, and I do have ADD, so I'm very absent-minded. And a few weeks ago, my, my wife called me and she said, we need you to pick up some Hamburg buns and then some other odds and ends at Aldi's on your way home. So I'm absent-minded, so I wrote it down, because that was a good idea. I even put it on my phone. Why, I don't know. My phone doesn't ever seem to beep when I need it to, but I put it on my phone just in case. And I was thinking about, you know, like, I'm really trying to remember this. So I said to myself, I had to bring hamburg buns, need some milk, and I, wrote, I wrote, said everything I have to bring. started mulling over, like, what, why do I need all this stuff? I wonder what we're having for supper. So then I went over next door to Jeremy. I said, hey, Jeremy, Rachel said I have to go get hamburg buns. What do you think we're having for supper tonight? And Jeremy had this wonderful conversation about what might, we might put on hamburg buns to have for supper. In fact, we wrote a song. About, the, about what we could do, and it goes something like this. Oh, I love to go to Aldi's to buy hamburger buns. My wife called me, I'll pick them up, and I'll take them all home. Valerie, and then, that was the song. It's a great song, isn't it? And you know what I did that day? I got in my car and I went straight home, <laughs> singing the song. None of that happened, by the way. But don't you wish it did? <laughs> don't you wish it did? Because you've all done that, right? You're going to do something, you go straight on home. And it did happen, I did not sing the song, but I did go past all these and turned around in one of the retirement homes on Cottonwood. I'd go back to all these to get hamburg buns so my wife doesn't know I forgot. So that part did happen. It does not matter how much we read God's Word and think about God's Word and talk about God's Word and sing great songs about God's Word. If you don't obey God's Word, you did not listen to God's Word. I don't know what you did, but it wasn't following Jesus. It was some weird religion where you think about a book and talk about a book and sing about a book and memorize the book and don't do anything the book tells you to do. And that ain't Christianity. It just ain't. When Jesus says that, that you should not be like the Pharisees who are busy making their tithe and splitting up their spices so they follow their tithe, you should go beyond a tithe. He doesn't mean you should you know, think about tithing. He means you should go beyond a tithe in your giving. When Jesus says that you should love your enemies, he doesn't mean that you should love people like you. He means that if you think someone is your enemy, you should intentionally go and love them. That if someone is persecuting you, you shouldn't seek vengeance. You ought to be praying for them. Because that's what you should do. That if someone is homeless and shirtless, you should give them your shirt and invite them into your house. That if someone is a refugee, you should invite them in because they have nowhere else to go. Because that's what followers of Jesus do. God says, this is my son whom I love. I am pleased with him. Listen to him. Do we listen to Jesus? Or do we just talk about the great things he says? and put them in pictures on our walls, and sing really cool songs about them, but never actually obey. There's a reason people who aren't here get annoyed with Christians. Because if we're honest, we're really good at singing songs about buying hamburg buns, but not picking them up. We're really good at talking about Jesus and not actually obeying. You know, I was struck this week that Jesus was known as the one who is the friend of sinners. He was known as the friend of sinners. Sinners, the non-religious people whose lives were a mess, loved hanging out with Jesus. Do they love hanging out with us? If they don't, we're not living like Jesus and we're not listening to him. We might want to say we're wonderful, good religious people, but if sinners don't want to hang out with you, you're not living like Jesus did. You can't call yourself a disciple. You might be religious, 
but you're not following. This is my son whom I love. I am pleased with him. Listen to him. May we have the courage to not only hear his words, but to put them into practice and obey. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, your word is hard for us. It challenges how we understand our world. It challenges how we live. It is hard to hear and obey. And so we ask today, as we read your word this week, as we try to understand you more fully, that you would give us the courage to not simply read your word, but to begin to live it out in our lives. We pray this in your son's name. Amen.